We're going live? Yeah. Good morning. Hold on. You're live. Good morning, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Nicholas Hacko. And I'm and Josh Hacko. Josh is my son. And the uh, title of this uh, short presentation is Too Old, Too Dumb, and Not Willing to Invest. But more about that in a second. We are here really to celebrate our eighth birthday. I think so, at least. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we are celebrating and if you have tuned in, we don't know how many people have tuned in so far, but if you tuned in, if you have any questions to ask at any time, please feel free to do so. And if we, um, we will, we'll be straightforward and honest with you. Uh, but if you have to leave early, whenever that is, you're free to go. You're not going to break my heart. Um, so, eight years ago, um, what happened eight years ago? Eight years ago was uh, an important moment in, in our life. How, how old are you eight years ago? I think I was 14. 14. And 14. I, was, I was 50. And big deal uh, at that time was uh, a push from uh, major Swiss brands uh, to restrict supply of spare parts to independent watchmakers. And it wasn't just in Australia, it was a, it was a global thing. So basically, uh, except for probably US, I think watchmakers in the US have a little bit of privileges, they still do have. They can get access to uh, most parts of most Swiss brands, but in Europe, in Australia, and certainly all, all over the world, getting spare parts to fix your high-grade Swiss watch is difficult. Brand simple, brands simple refuse to supply spare parts because uh, they say that our standard of repair is not even close to their standard of repair. And you can only imagine for a small independent watchmaker, I'm, I'm third generation watchmaker, my father was a watchmaker, my grandfather was a watchmaker and they're both still alive and Josh was 14 about to enter the trade. It was devastating news because uh, if we can't get the spare parts to repair watches, uh, there, is, there is no future for mm. trade. It's like a, a mechanic not being able to get spark plugs or anything to service a car, right? Mm. So it was, it was a very, very uh, vicious move from uh, Swiss brands who for good 50 or 60 years relied on independent watchmakers to service their watches. Uh, we were cut off literally overnight mm. and uh, it was the problem was the problem was yes it was a, a blow to independent watchmaker but it was even more so a blow to owners of high-grade Swiss watches because if they couldn't get second opinion on what their watch need you know servicing repair wise and if their only option now is the brand service uh, they're left with no options. Mm. So, eight years ago, we took this matter to, on behalf of our customers, to ACCC, which is Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. And we started a campaign called Save the Time. Mm -hmm. Save the Time, and you know, we want to, we want to do something about it. We, we, we feel oppressed. We feel that if this is not right. There is no justice in a, in a, in a, in a, in a watchmakers being cut off and cut out and there is no justice to consumers mm. you see a triple c australian government they don't care about watchmakers but they do care about consumers and that was the we got we got a huge support from from a thousand plus signatures and yeah yeah at the time where signatures were coming in by fax you remember <laughs> that yeah, fax machine fax machine you know you, you you guys people who support us you were more than happy to, to you know, sign petition and then we, we piled that, you know, those petitions and we took them to ACCC office in Sydney. Do mm. you remember that? Yeah. We went down, it was just down the road really from, from where our office is. There was one lunchtime, I think we had a meeting. We went in and we, I guess, pled the case. It was, well, you pled, I was just there, I was eye candy. And, <laughs> and, um, and it was a disaster. Confronting, yeah, definitely a disaster. <laughs> it was a disaster. So that here, here I was and Josh, two of us, trying to represent the case of all Australian watch owners 
to highest government body that takes care of consumers' rights. This is the same government body that kind of controls the banks and well, and, and Microsoft. Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, and Microsoft. That's right. Yeah, and uh, you know, Google. Yeah, and so it was the, not 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 only that. It was five of them yeah. and two of us. That's right. <laughs> who were outnumbered. <laughs> plus, plus, I remember a direct link to Canberra. You remember yes. That? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So they were very enthusiastic, you know, to hear our case, but we failed miserably because they did not understand, you know, government, especially government employees, they, they have very little interest in, in horology and, and we never had a manufacturing industry in Australia, watch yeah. manufacturing industry. So it was, it was a new issue. So uh, their response was, what was really heartbreaking is, is the way how I responded to, 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 to our, our submission. Uh, I remember that dude going on online. You know, first, he was like, I can see him, you know, typing something into his laptop for about, you know, five minutes while listening to us. And then all of a sudden, he turned to switch the uh, laptop towards me and goes, Well, you say you can't get spare parts for, I think he said Breitling at the time. Look, I'm on eBay now, and there is uh, like hundreds of parts for Breitling available from all over the world. And, and you just you say like, no, you idiot, you know, this, <laughs> you can't fix Breitling. You can't fix Breitling by going on eBay and buying their spare parts, you know, from, from, from eBay. You can't fix any brand. And quite frankly, if I'm Breitling, I'll be offended if an independent watchmaker would, you know, go online and buy, you know, fake parts and buy fa pa yeah. parts from China, you know, and yeah. to fix their high, high grade watch that they invested in. So what we wanted is not just spare parts. We wanted to be recognized as watchmakers capable of repairing high-grade watches. Channel and of communication between the brand and the independent. Right. Mm. And uh, that, was, that was a bit disappointing because they didn't get a message. And uh, brands uh, took advantage of it even further because mm. they said, well, you know, I remember again a phone call from a... From a a director of, of a, one of the largest and most famous brands in the world, you know, calling me and say, hey, uh, uh, you know, what you guys trying to do? You know, you're trying to, to you, you're trying to stir the, the public against us, like, like you're trying to present us as a bad guys. I said, no, no, all we want is we want to be trained. We want to be part of a brand. We want to continue to service your watches at professional level, at, at the, you know, so we can provide service to our customers. It's simple as that. And he said, uh, no, not really, you know. I said, well, I'm 50, you know, I'm at the peak of my career. And uh, he said, well, you know what, you're too old. You're too old to be trained properly. And basically also he said, you're too dumb to be trained and you're not willing to invest. Mm. And, and that was an insult. And, and, and this, is, this is exactly what they still Telling customers, if you if you go to a, a brand name service center, say, hey, I, you know, I want to get a quote, but I'm also going to take a watch to Nick Hacko for a second opinion because he's a master watchmaker and I've dealt with him and I trust him. They're going to say, oh no no no, you can't do that. It's not a good idea because mm -hmm. he can't fix your watch. Mm -hmm. And they're right. I cannot fix their watch. Yeah, but not because you can't, but because someone made you unable to. That's right. Not, not because I'm too old and too dumb and not willing to invest. I'm pushed out because of the greed and monopoly and monopolist, mon monopolist stand, which is a global issue, mm. by Swiss major brands. Mm. So I remember those times I was really desperate. I, yeah. was, I was at my lowest. Remember that? Yeah. Well, I remember... Um, a filmmaker approached you right at the time around Save the Time happened and uh, said, hey, let's do like a documentary on those, I guess something along the lines of a promotion for, for the campaign. And he interviewed you, well, no, sorry, he interviewed Max Schweitzer, mm -hmm. who was uh, our colleague, colleague in, in, in Sydney, a watchmaker as well, um, who had, who was an ex Rolex um, service manager in Egypt right yeah, for for Rolex Middle East for about 17 years or something yeah he was a head of a service department for for Rolex yes so this filmmaker interviewed him 
and made this documentary and it was it was very somber it was it was kind of like this is the death of watchmaking there's no after this point there will be no watchmaking yes, and then i remember about a year later i made a documentary for my for high for a high school project that was called like the portrait of a watchmaker and i interviewed i interviewed you but i took a lot of inspiration from that first documentary and i specifically remember you saying in that documentary Watchmaking. In fact, it was the opening line. Watchmaking is dead. The watchmaking is dead. And it was dead for me because, again, you know, 50 years old at the peak of my career, trained to do something, and now, you know, what am I going to do? And it wasn't just a major, the major, the largest, the biggest brand that started restricting restricting spare parts. It was across the board. It was at one point that you know the crappiest brand in Switzerland feels powerful enough now to say no. You can't get out spare parts. It, that yeah. drives me nuts. You know that makes my blood boil. Like, mm. what right do you have to restrict supply of spare part for your five hundred dollars watch? Basically, basically, you know, d doing disservice to your customer. Mm. Anyway, so that was the lowest point eight years ago, and that that's when the the whole thing started. You know, after maybe three, four, five weeks, uh, you know, leaking my wounds, I, I kind of came to realization that. The only way, the only way for me to continue what I do and to stay in a business and, you know, pass my knowledge to, to you and to other kids, Australian kids, was to start our own brand. Mm -hmm. So if you want to fight a brand, you have to start your own brand. So idea was simple, but, you know, how do you start your brand? How mm -hmm. do you, how do you start your brand? And I, I, I'm not, you know, brand Expert. Expert, you know, and so in my, my mind it was, okay, I'm going to start designing a watch, a simple watch that will be robust and reliable and repairable and that I know it will work and I will, you know, I will base it around a proven caliber, which is a Swiss caliber. We started with ETA 6497, uh, a, 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 you know, a diesel generator of Swiss movements, manual wind watch very easy to work on you know super reliable and yeah we, we I, I started you know uh, sending those drawings to various component manufacturers like i needed a case clearly i needed mm. crystal and case seal and winding crown and and and, and uh, it was it was quite a challenge and the first batch was 75 watches and oh wait well, you missed one part what was it you um before all of that happened as I think the initial act of rebellion, you designed a watch based on kind of almost like the bunnings of the watchmaker. Oh, right. Yeah, well, that, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it, well, the first point was not really to start a brand. Thank you. The first point was I will prove to Swiss brands that I'm a good watchmaker. Yes. Yeah. And in my mind, to prove that I'm a good watchmaker, well, all, all I need to do is really to put together 10 watches. That was my plan. That's right. And to put together 10 watches, I will go to bunnings of spare parts. I'll get some bits and pieces here and there and just put them together. And, and in my mind, I, I, would, I was prepared to take this to, you know, Swiss and say, hey, I'm a good watchmaker. I was prepared to fight for my, you know, to prove that I'm, I'm good at what I do. And then that was announced to our newsletter, in our new newsletter. And I said, I'm doing 10 watches, guys, putting them together. And that afternoon, we got 113 people who replied and said, I'll buy that watch from you. And that, that was kind of initial moment when I realized that there was a support. There was a huge support from people who follow what we do, you know, from our subscribers uh, to a newsletter from our previous customers mm -hmm. that we stay in touch. They, they love the idea. They yeah. love, you know, they love to see you suffer. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So then you moved on to then I moved. Then I said, well, no, no, I'm not going now to go the Bunnings sort of deal. I'm going to start designing my own watch and I will get the proper watch manufacturers to make parts for Swiss, you know, to make parts for me. And at that point, those nine, well, 10 watches, the zero nine. Yeah. That's what the project we call zero nine. Yeah, zero nine. That's right. Um, that died nearly as soon as it was incepted because its purpose no longer was relevant because if you had 113 people to support you you yep. didn't need nine watches you needed 113 and uh to make 113 watches from bunnings yep. wasn't wasn't smart enough it's not it's not sophisticated no and so you moved on to designing and getting the parts 
contract about. And, and, and the highest point in, of that phase was when the first parts started arriving in. You know? mm. I got 2,000 hands. Mm. You know, I got 5,000 seconds hands. You know, I, got, I got dials, I got crystals. You know, all the 11 manufacturers making opponents. And it was all done remotely. You know, they, uh, uh, well, and that was a nightmare. You know? So you got your, 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 your components coming in. Mm. Would they fit? You know, yeah. 11 makers making 11 different components that will have to start life together in a fairly sophisticated product. It's a watch we're talking about. Yeah. It's not a chair or, mm. or a table. It's not IKEA kind of, you know, thing. And it, it miracle did happen. Mm. I think we only had one problem with one crown, which was too loose. And, but part of that, it was, it was, it was a miracle. Um, so yeah, that's how we started making, started, started with our own brand. Mm. And uh, so why is the brand important? Because brand kept us busy. Brand kept us in a business, designing, assembling, servicing our own watches. And the whole idea was simple. The more we sell, if we can get to a level where we can have like 200 watches and 300 watches and 500 watches out there, I, I figure out that if we can get 500 rebelde watches out there, there will be enough to support one person for the rest of his life. Just to look after those watches, sell the leather straps, yeah. grow the brand. So it, it only took 500 watches. We've got Alexander Sladic here. Mm -hmm. He says, every art is produced from passion, which means suffering in Latin. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> they like seeing our suffering, but well, maybe they, they like seeing the art as well. So <laughs> um, good to see you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Uh, yeah, lots of suffering, but, but we, you know, it was, it was, it wasn't bad at all. It was. I feel great about this. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I came from the lowest point and I was climbing up. You know, every day was better, in the sense that there was a, finally a future, and and we wanted to inspire other watchmakers to do the same or, or to in, in their domain. Mm -hmm. But, you know, after that, probably a year or two of, of excitement, we yeah. reached another weak point. A as I was assembling watches that contain components made by, you know, 11 manufacturers, I was constantly looking at those components and thinking, surely, surely, <laughs> surely there has to be at least one component in a watch that I can make here in my workshop in Australia. So to move from that uh, screwdriver industry mm -hmm. to makers industry, mm -hmm. but with one component, that, that was the plan. And we started thinking, like, what is, and if you're a watchmaker, you, you can probably answer this question. And I asked this question to, to watchmakers, and, and they kind of failed to agree. But what is the simplest component in a watch that can be manufactured with least amount of effort and sophistication and equipment? And, and you know, playing with that component, you know, installing it every day, I just, I just could not help but think, Surely I can make this. Which was a dial washer. Dial washer, yeah. And so it's more or less a, um, a spring washer. So it's made of maybe like point, 0 0.07 millimeters brass with a hole in it. Doesn't need to be a, like a tight fit or a loose fit. It just needs to fit over a minute wheel. Minute wheel. Between the dial and wheel. Between the dial and the wheel. And all it does is just push the, the minute wheel enough that it's that it's there yeah and uh, funnily enough it's actually a little bit <laughs> tricky to make a little bit trickier to make than we initially thought but well we, we still haven't made it we still haven't made it <laughs> <laughs> we still haven't made it because uh, we somehow started doing our research into manufacturing you see completely new area I, I was trained as a watch repairer yeah. not not manufacturer so I was not a brand starter maker I was not a manufacturer uh, but I started talking to people and you know watching YouTube videos how Swiss components are made and mm -hmm. and we stumbled to a video. You you found a video about what? It was made by Tornos, which is a um, a lathe manufacturer, so a Swiss lathe manufacturer, and they have a video that shows the manufacturing process of a pinion and. Um, Opinion is actually one of the <laughs> probably one of the most difficult 
parts to make outside of this game in, in the watch. And it showed how easily it was made, effortlessly, you know, in like one minute and 22 seconds or something like that, it just made the, made the entire thing. And we said, well, oh, okay, that must be the machine. That must be the fabled watchmaking machine. So you put raw material in on one end and you get parts out the other, well, not even parts, you get a, a watch. <laughs> Almost a whole watch. A whole watch. <laughs> and uh, we were really excited. I remember getting a phone call from dad on my way to, I, I believe it was uni at that point, and it was um, something along the lines of, hey, I found this machine, like we, we, we just talked about the video a, a little bit, and he said, I found this machine, I reckon we can buy it, I reckon we can put it where, like, where we're currently situated and we can make a watch. I said, oh, interesting, okay, how much does it cost? Like $10,000, maybe $20,000. And he said something like, oh, it's about half a million or like 400,000, and I said, <laughs> that's you're an idiot don't even why, why are you doing this yeah. but, but, but then quickly we got in touch with Tornos uh, sales rep a serviceman in Australia Peter Stebner yeah Peter who, who who kind of knew something about how parts are made not necessarily in the watch industry that's right and he had a second hand Tornos well that he would be happy you know he was happy to sell to us and yeah I mean looking back on it we were really naive. We knew nothing about anything. Yeah. And the machine that he, this is only looking back, the machine he wanted us to buy was already at that point about 15 years old and had been running in 24 seven production for wood screws. So it's probably the least precise component and it was down in Victoria, which is about a thousand kilometers away. And, it's, and it seemed tempting. That was like, oh wow, we can get a, we can get a pinion making machine for, I don't know, maybe like $100,000, $200,000 instead of the $400,000. Um, but then we started talking about this, the, the machine that we'd saw, seen in the video. No, no, I asked him, would that machine fit in our office? That was a question. Would the Tornos... Swiss Nano. And he said, yeah, there is a Swiss Nano. That's right. That one was 400 something yes. thousand, which we didn't have to start with, but. Uh, he said, yeah, that machine would fit in your office. You'll yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. So yeah. our office <laughs> it is in the center of Sydney. It's um, on the fourth floor. On the fourth floor. So if you, if you know S Sydney, it's the center point tower, which is kind of right in the middle of the tallest building. And we're yeah. literally right underneath that. And it's on the fourth floor. Of a uh, heritage building. Of a heritage building with... With a 800 kilos lift uh, access. Lift access. Like four people can fit into. And he said, yeah, that, that machine will definitely fit into your thing. And not only that, he said, and this is nothing against Peter. Peter's a fantastic Peter's guy. Peter's a nice guy. <laughs> uh, but he just, I guess, didn't... But didn't we ask him stupid <laughs> questions. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. I think we led him down the wrong road. He said, that machine will make 70% of a watch. And I said, oh, 70%, that's pretty good. Yeah, one machine, one 70%. Machine. He probably said 70% of cylindrical components. Yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was, I guess, the start, the very, the very introduction. And I just want to point out, we've got some comments. We've got Dan Rudolph, um, awesome guy from the US. Hey, Dan. And uh, we've got MC or McKernovic. McKernovic mm -hmm. from Perth. Good to see you as well. Hello, Perth. <laughs> Hello, Perth. Yeah. So, so very naive, extremely naive. Yeah. Yeah. And, and. The more vi videos we watch, well, the next step was what? We said, okay, we, we, we don't know much about this. We need to do... Well, before that, there was one step. Before we went to the trade show, yeah. we got in touch with another machine tool builder um, because we did some preliminary research and we were really, really, really interested in prices. Like, mm. how much does this really cost? Yeah. Because we had no idea. How much does a CNC machine cost? How much does this, you know, piece of support equipment cost? And we got in touch with pass and mm. the good thing with the pass was they had all of their prices on their website yeah so you could instantly see what that machine cost and it was about what, like 130,000 was a was a amount that we kind of we scrape yeah. all the money and you know go really with no food for a year yeah. we could afford that's so, fantastic hundred thirty thousand yeah. dollars and we um hello Texas hey Ed. how's it going and um, we went to the Haas dealer yeah. and we said, this is what we want to make. Uh, not only that, we didn't know anything about tolerances. Oh yeah. We didn't know anything about mm. what a watch required to, to, to kind of function in terms of how accurate in the, the machined parts need to be. And so 
we went um, to, I just distinctly remember this, we went to a customer that already had a Haas office mill OM2A, which is kind of like their really small, compact, high speed spindle. It's a machine. fridge size. Yeah, it's like fridge. And you could, it was single phase and you could fit it through a doorway. And those were two really important things. We yeah. still thought that we could put it not this time in our in our office, yeah. but in our garage. In a garage. So we moved from a city office to a garage workshop yeah. with like a like a thirty degree uh, driveway <laughs> as well that we'd have to like roll the machine down or like let it go and see where it lands, kind of thing. And we say, oh, this is this might be the solution. And um, single phase was attractive and high speed was attractive. And so we went to the customer that already had one of these machines installed. And as we were leaving the customer, we'd seen the machine looked nice. It was like we had no idea what we were looking at. And the service and tech support guy, so not the salesman for, for Haas machines, the service and tech support guys, as we're kind of walking into the car to leave, thinking we'd purchase the machine, asks us, so what tolerances are you looking for? And I, I this was like a this was like a standoff question. I didn't know what the answer was, yeah. and neither did Nick, and Nick turned to me and I turned to Nick and I said, Oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah. well, accurate. We want we want to be accurate. Maybe like zero point one millimeters. Like <laughs> maybe maybe like zero point one five millimeters. It's oh yeah, that'll be that. Yeah. This is a machine. Ask can do it. Ask can do it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> little did we know, we were two orders of magnitude out. So mm -hmm. um, that's that's what we did, and that was I guess maybe September twenty no uh, Ju July twenty sixteen. July twenty sixteen. And again, you know, more research. Uh, it's like buying a car. You know, you need to see a few, a few showrooms before you can, especially if it's your first car. I don't know. Mm. And uh, so we went to. We decided to pack and go to Germany to That's right, to Stuttgart at the AMB Fair um, in 2016. So that was, I think, se November, yeah. September, October, November. That range. Um, so it's starting to get a little bit cold, but that was our first sort of experience in what manufacturing could be. And we were really green still. We knew a little bit, I guess. We knew that... Well, we had parts. That's, that's the that's key right. thing. Yes. We took with us to Germany, we took parts. We took screws, stems, barrel, main main barrel, main plate, bridges, all the components that we kind of thought we might be able to make. Mm -hmm. And we took those components to 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 fair, That's and then we started walking and talking to people, you know, selling there, you know, displaying there. I, I remember exhibitors, <laughs> and you just say, hey, you know, can your can your machine make this, you know? Get this. So I, this is this is kind of like nightmare fuel now, and I'm cringing just thinking about it. But it's a hilarious story that illustrates how green we were. We got to Stuttgart. We spent about a day there and uh, just acclimatizing and the fair started the next day. So as we're going to the fair, we walk into the first hall of, um, of the Stuttgart Messe and we see a Haas Formula One car because I think 2016 was probably either the first or second year that Haas entered Formula One. And I said, Haas, that's the machine that we saw. Fantastic, they're here. We can talk to them more and see like, you know, what our tolerances could end up being. We quickly brushed past that and we entered the first actual booth uh, in, in these massive halls and it was a discount carbide supplier. So they supplied tooling, not, not a machine, not, not even um, like a, a process or anything like that, but they supplied tools. And not only tools, they supplied like the, the discount copy tools. <laughs> Of, um, of, of, of big brands, of the big brands. So it's like you have Kenner Metal, you have Sandvik, you have Sumitomo, and all the rest. They supplied like the, the B grade, the cheaper stuff. And I see, I, I turn to Nick, and Nick turns to me, and he kind of said, "Okay, let's start." So we go to them, and we hold up a main plate or something, like a barrel, yeah. Yeah. and we say, "Can your machine <laughs> do this? Can, can your machine? Can your tool do?" It? No, no, no. It was machine. <laughs> and they kind of just looked at us and said. And machines are uh, like, you know, like down <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we learned fast. I think that, that, that week was, uh, was an eye-opener in, yes. in so many ways. And we learn about metrology. We learn about, we learn about the most important thing. And that is to, you have to, have, you have, to, you have to develop ability to read 
the DNA of the watch, mm. right? And and that ability to the DNA is in a watch, but mm. you have to have a process ability, a knowledge to read that DNA. And if you read the DNA of the watch, then you can build a watch. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, but and that's based purely one hundred percent on metrology, I would say. It's it's the mainly yeah. yeah. It's the ability firstly to see. So you have to you have to have some sort of magnification, some sort of microscope, because you can't even with a loop, you cannot even see what's happening. Um, and then the second step is to measure. So I think actually, uh, truth be told, we, we bought our first piece of measuring equipment before we went to Stuttgart. Yeah. Um, but we didn't have very much time spent working on it. It was a, it was a Mitutoyo profile projector with 50 times magnification and glass scales and a computer. So you could, it, was, it was very advanced. In fact, we still use it today. So it's a great piece of kit. Um, but it was more sort of, you know, Windows yeah, 3.1. That's right. Kind of. Maybe 98. Know, with Windows. a 98? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, we, as you say, we still use it today. Yeah, we learned a lot. And, and thanks to that machine, that machine gave us ability to read, read the DNA. DNA reverse engineer. The, reverse but, engineer, yeah. but yeah. Now, the problem with watchmaking is it is a secretive trade. You can't just pick your phone and call someone, you know, in, in Switzerland and say, hey, I want to make a watch and, you know, can you tell me what, what, what are the, you know, distances between third wheel and fourth wheel and what are the, you know, angles when it comes to escapement and, you know, what is the tolerance, what is the end shape of a balance wheel? You may, I can feel it, you know, as a watchmaker, I know, but I can't measure it. Mm. You know, is it, is it 20 microns, is it 5 microns, is it 2 microns, is it somewhere in between? So, yeah, and then we, so we, we realized that this is expensive game yeah. in Stuttgart, right? In Stuttgart, we realized that we're really out of our league in, in terms of everything. So I think, I mean, everyone's interested in price. I think that's kind of like a big motivating factor, but no, um, no machine tool seller really wants to start there. They want to sell you on the capability of the machine first and say, oh, it'll make you money. Don't mm. worry about the price. But, mm. We didn't have any ability to make money on it, so we couldn't. I, I, and, the, and the recurring sort of um, mantra that was that was playing in our heads was, well, if we buy this machine and it doesn't work out, how much can we sell it for? Yeah, that to was recover our costs. That's right. How much we're we going to lose if we invest in this machine and we couldn't run it? We'd not. We wouldn't know how to run it. We bring it to you know. We, it comes to Australia. Who's going to buy it in Australia? Yeah. Well, like, you know, there was no, no yeah. secondary market for, for what we get with me. And I have to say, I had one big disadvantage being <laughs> there with you, Josh. You know, <laughs> every, every, like, I remember Willeman is staying. Yeah. Willeman is kind of yeah, top it? tier, I guess. Uh, yeah. yeah, sort of the Ferrari in, in, yeah. in watchmaking machines. And, so, and, and it was Josh who was doing the talking, you know, because he's the machinist and I'm a watchmaker, right? But by then I was not a machinist. Yeah. Either. <laughs> so and it was always like, how old are you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think I was, I was maybe 18 at that time. Yeah. And but you look older. I had a beard. You had a beard. Had a beard. So, so yeah. we fooled him. They thought he was like 25, 26. Years. And they thought I knew what I was talking yeah. about. Yeah. That's most important. So who did we see at AMB? Uh, we see everyone, like, you know, quite a few. But it wasn't watch making fair. No. It was a more like automotive industry sort of machinery fair. Which yeah. Stuttgart Black Forest, you had Porsche in Stuttgart. Yeah, Mercedes. Mercedes. Yeah. So it was a fair uh, set. It's a huge fair, but it was set to basically support and sell machinery to automotive industry. Mm -hmm. uh, Hi, Ted from Chicago. Good to see you. And Ed's just uh, saying how great it is to hear the story in detail. Well, thank you, Ed. Um, that's very, very nice to hear. And to Central Coast and to Brisbane. Yeah, John and Alan. Yeah. Good to hear from you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I hope we're not boring you to death with this story, but, mm -hmm. you know, it is kind of, you know, our... our Origins. Origins, yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a birthday, so we we are free to kind of explore things, and we try to rem why we try to reminisce, yeah, we try to encourage you because mm. we try to encourage you in a way that you know even if we look naive and downright stupid, everyone starts like 
even Rolex was not even stupid a hundred years ago. Mm. You know, they started doing exactly what we did. You know, putting together a, 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 an accountant, mm. Hans Wilsdorf was an accountant working for us as another brand. Yeah. Right? He was an accountant. He was a clever guy. He was not a watchmaker. The father of Rolex. He was a, an accountant, a bookkeeper with other brain and he re recognized, he realized, got well, this brilliant idea that he can start his own brain, but he didn't have money either. He had to write to his sister and uh, to one in London. And that, that's, that's the connection. That, that's why the, the Rolex was, you know, started in Switzerland and London, because, you know, sister uh, uh, and, and husband, her husband, were investors. And he said, well, this is easy. Look, I'm sitting here in Switzerland, there's millions of parts. I'm going to put them together. I'm going to make a watch, I call it Rolex and I will sell it in England. It was simple as that, you know, that's how Rolex started. That was only 100 years ago. Mm. You know, so, so, you know, that, nothing to be ashamed of, I, I guess, you know. So, so if you have a project that you worry about and you want to start, I don't know, you have to figure out how you're going to do it, but, you know, being naive is not a problem. Mm. It's not, it shouldn't stop you from exploring and learning and finding out, mm. you know, how things work. Mm. And, and, um, so, then we discover uh, Monsieur Groib. That's right. Groib. Um, Maxime Gro Francois? Maxime Francois. Actually, Maxime Francois is the reason why we're in our position today. That's right. I have to say thank you. Thank you, Max. <laughs> thank you, Max. You made it happen. I mean, he's a single most important person. You know, okay. Ma Max is a. A Swiss billionaire who <laughs> invested uh, five billion Swiss francs in us. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> so who's Max? Max. Um, let, let me paint a picture of who Max Francois Groy. Maximilian Francois Groy is. I don't think he likes actually being called Max. No, no, no. Um, uh, so if you if you you can, you can actually go onto your computer and type in Groy, G R E U B, <clears throat> and he's a second-hand machine tool seller based in Le Chaux de Fonds Fond in Switzerland, which is kind of the watchmaking hub, the industrial watchmaking hub. And um, we actually, just before we left, I think it was the week before we left yeah. to Stuttgart, yeah. I popped on and kind of looked for machines and I saw he was selling an Almac CU 1007 uh, milling machine, which was designed to make main plates and bridges for the watchmaking industry. Got to say, not the most successful machine tool Project, brand yeah. and, and ever. <laughs> in, in, I mean, there was a reason why someone else was selling one. Um, but I said to him, hey, we're in Stuttgart. Are you going to be in Stuttgart? And he said, yes, I'll be in Stuttgart. Let's meet up. Mm. Yeah. So Max is maybe, may, well, back then, he was maybe in his like early 30s. Yeah, 35-ish. 35-ish. Like flamboyant. Flamboyant. Longish hair. So kind of... Uh, but to be fair, I had longish hair then as well, so it's yeah. a longish hair, smoked, um, drunk a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and look, Max, if, if you <laughs> end up watching this, we love you and you're, 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 you're just <laughs> telling the truth. But it's the truth. But, but he, he drinks a $500, 500 Swiss francs bottle of wine. Bottle of wine. That's right. And with great pleasure. And he's, he's not, he enjoys it and he knows his wine. Yeah. And he's friends with everyone. And he's the, he's the... He's like he's like the playboy of of the Swiss, Swiss industrial watchmaking scene. He knows everyone. Yeah. He deals. He's second hand dealer. He buys when when you know name brand that is you know La Chaux de Fond and everyone is La Chaux de Fond. Uh, factory wants to buy five new mills and they want to get rid of their five old mills, second hand mills. They call Max and his father. His father started the business uh, and said, Max, we got you know those those machines that we want to get rid of and and sell them and that's what he does he refurbished them yeah. it's a huge operation it's massive he's got maybe um, I hazard to say 10 to 20 people working for him and they do machine rebuilding as well so if we have a problem with a like an old machine that it's not keeping its accuracy anymore he'll come in take it rebuild it and then send it back to you so he's I mean, not him himself, but he's got a, an operation that does that, and um, a shrewd businessman. He's he's a businessman more than anything. I love I love him. You know, he's he's a yeah, he's a good guy. So we we just we realize that we don't have to buy a brand new machine. That's right. 
that there is a solution that it will fit our budget. So instead of buying one brand new machine, we can buy three second-hand machines. Correct. Correct. Then we'll do the job. And, and Max was the one who said, yeah, this machine can do this and that machine can do, you know, because he's, he's a second-hand dealer. He's got, you know, he wants to move his stock, but, yes. you know, he knows that if we build a relationship that, you know, he's got, his interest would be to tell us how it is. Yes. Yeah. And uh, he was actually a breath of fresh air because at AMB, um, the secrecy of the watchmaking industry kind of pervaded and, and, and we couldn't actually find out a lot. If you, if you brought a main plate to someone and said, hey, can your machine make this? They'll always say yes. But if, if it actually could is another question. And in fact, when I talked to him, I said, hey, look, we're really looking at this CU 1007 Almac machine that you had uh, for sale. And it had like a robot as well. It was fantastic and it was quite cheap. He said it was like 100,000 Swiss francs and that was, you know, Quarter of the price of the quarter, yeah, a quarter of the price of a new one, or something like that. But he he turned around and said, "Look, Josh, you don't want this machine." And that was the first time someone said no to me, and I was kind of shocked. And I said, "Well, why? Why not?" And, I mean, it's it says on the website, on the pamphlet, on the flyer, and he said, "Well, it might say, but from my experience, and he had a lot of experience from Max's experience, he saw that those machines were getting sold a lot. They, they were." Maybe the factories didn't like them, the operators didn't like them. All the things that, you know, come with 10 years of experience. So, well, there was another problem that we faced there. You know, every time, like, because I, I come from non-English speaking background. I migrated <coughs> to Australia 25 years ago and you can see I have a heavy accent. And, you know, you can guess it's a, it's a, it's a central European, you know, I'm, I'm originally ex-Yugoslav and, you know, people in Switzerland, they think I'm Russian. That's Sometimes right. they think I'm South African, I don't know why, but, <laughs> uh, which I take as a compliment. Uh, so they were always confused, like Josh speaks English, also with accent, uh, I, yeah, a little bit. Uh, I, I clearly Australian accent. Australian. <laughs> and they were asking like, where do you guys come from? Like, what are you doing here? Who are you? And it was, was, and I said, we're from Australia. And they, they always laugh. Yeah, that was the reaction. It was, it was. They didn't take us seriously to start off with because it's... I don't like think they still take us seriously. Oh, no, definitely not. But they, <laughs> they didn't take us seriously because he was old and like... Dumb. And, and I was young and naive. And it was like a, just a weird combination. Ethnic and like, like yeah. a little bit more Caucasian. And mm -hmm. Not that you're not white, but yeah. it's just... It was weird. And then when we say Australia, it's like, you, you guys must yeah. be joking. You're... Yeah. you're 20,000 or whatever it is, yeah. 15 to 20,000 kilometers away. And 10 years, uh, 20 years yeah, and behind, behind <laughs> every, like the, the technology curve. And not only that, watchmaking and Australia, two concepts that don't exist. It's like surfing, you've got like beautiful blonde beaches. women, uh, uh, beaches. <laughs> and, uh, then you've got like kangaroos. Why do you want to, why do you want to make a watch? Doing? Yeah, so. But we had a story to tell, and again, we told them the story. We, we were not happy with the way you guys from Switzerland treating small independent watchmakers, That's right. and we want to do something about it. And it was a powerful story to them. They, they listened to the story, they liked yeah. the story. And, they, and, and you know, I would say nine out of 10 times, they'll say, yeah, we deal with these brands, we supply machinery to them, they're not nice people, <laughs> you know? It wasn't like, you know, that you think of a Switzerland, that's, that's another eye-opener, you think of a Switzerland as a one big happy family. Yeah. Where all the machinists and all the watchmakers and all the brands and all the bankers, you know, and the financiers live together in peace and, you know, they just ski and party and sell watches to Chinese. That's not that, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's a little bit more complex, I think. You have people... Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to go into it too much in detail because, I, firstly, I don't know. I, I don't live in Switzerland, but the glimpses I've had into the Swiss watchmaking industry is that it's... It is secretive. It's very secretive, and that, I think, underpins a lot of the complexity and the problems mm -hmm. in, in lack of communication and NDAs that everyone has seen in the sign. I mean, a classic story is this. Every single person we... We walked past in that AMB mm -hmm. fair mm -hmm. when we asked them, hey, we're watchmakers, blah, 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 blah. And we asked them, hey, do you have maybe any, any watchmaking type of machines? They said, yes, we've got a machine in Rolex. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Rolex bought one of our machines. And you say, oh, Rolex, fantastic. If, we want that. If it's good for Rolex, it's good for us. It's yeah. good for us. And we then pushed a little bit further. And instantly, as soon as we started pushing, it's, oh, no, 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 we can't say anything. So 
but it was true. Like you think, how is it possible that the Rolex has every single machine, a measuring tool, piece of software? It's true. It's true. <laughs> it's true. I mean, Rolex is a huge operation. Massive. It's a massive operation. Well, when you have hundreds of millions, and that's what the figure is, hundreds of millions of Swiss franc to spend on your factory, um, you, you just constantly buy stuff to test. To if, if something is 1% better, right, you would, and it costs like 20% more, it doesn't matter. It's just get that thing. And um, it, it, that made it very complex as well because even though Rolex bought everything, it doesn't mean that everything that Rolex bought was good. Mm. And, but that's something we found out, I guess, later. And also it, it didn't mean, you know, that, that every manufacturer now, regardless of industry, is just aiming to chop the production of a complex machinery into components that it can be made on one equipment, piece of equipment, in huge volume, run by a hairdresser. That's right. Yeah. And that, that's what Rolex wants. And I mean, no disrespect to Rolex, this has got nothing to do really with Rolex. It's got to do, you know, Swiss industry employs watchmakers, but it, it employs far more people with very basic manual skills. Correct whose role is really just to press a button and make sure that the machine material is fed in and there is no, That's you know. That's right, yeah. So for, for Rolex, it's not necessarily always advantageous to buy the most complex machine, the one that would require an engineer and two technicians, you know, working on it and too versatile and that, that's the impression we got. And certainly, uh, so, so again, you, you, you know, there is no such a thing as a, a, a perfect machine for Rolex, a perfect machine for small independent watchmaker, yeah. a perfect machine for small brand, you know. Anyway, let's let's, let's speed it up. Let's this speed is, it up. This we, has we, got, we've got a good, I guess, understanding of what that A and B fair was, but there's one critical thing that we yeah. missed out, which was we went past the Citizen booth and the Tornos booth, and both of them were very interesting for us because we wanted, I think, out of all the components we wanted to make, we wanted to make screws yeah. and stems. stems. We, we, we figured out, if we to start with, we start with a small diameter cylindrical components. components yes. And, 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 and you've got plenty of screws in a watch. I, I look at it as a you know, value for money. You know, if I can make <laughs> eight components in one go on one machine, that, you know, yeah. they're still screws, but they're different screws, different type of screws. Right. And we, we then, you know, learning, was fast we realized that you know it's all based on diameter that's right so you have uh, the machines they're all split up into diameter ranges you have a zero to four millimeters zero machine. to one a zero to one you yes, have a right. zero to one millimeter machine and then you have a, a one to four millimeter machine that can go a little bit below and then you have a four millimeter to um, 12 or 16 well maybe like two millimeter to seven millimeter yeah. let's say uh, and then maybe. and then seven to 12 and then from 12 to 20 and then 20 and then beyond that it's it's kind of you're leaving watchmaking more into automotive and, and other sort of com complex components so the question was which range which should, we, range go should we go for yeah and the tornos people said look you, you you can you'll have to buy a couple of machines that's what the the kind of end um message that we got from both tornos and citizen and we said well let's start off in a four millimeter machine and we went to Tornos and they gave us a quote and it was about I mean, 170,000 Swiss franc for a Tornos Swiss Nano, which was not, not actually that uh, expensive for that type of machine. And look, these prices I think are very dependent on like the shipping and the, the installation costs and all the rest. And then we went to the Japanese equivalent of Tornos, which is Citizen. Citizen also make watches and that's kind of what stood out to us as well. Mm -hmm. said, they use their own machines to make watches. It's probably good enough for us. Yeah. And they have uh, an equivalent machine called the Citizen R04. So it was between the Swiss Nano and R04. And we said, well, okay, um, we've got about this amount of money and the Citizen is about 20 to 30% cheaper. Let's buy the Citizen. And we... And, 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 and as much I love growing i still wanted to buy a, a first machine to be a brand new machine. correct yeah you know uh so we ended up buying the machine at the fair at the signing fair. the check at the fair and they gave us a little bit of a discount because we did that little did we know that that was the first fair or maybe the second fair but first international fair that machine was exhibited at and we got serial number 10. 
of, of that machine. So it's almost a prototype. It's probably a prototype machine. You know, they make like five and just to test. And then it's limited us in tooling initially. Correct. Yeah, um, but that's okay. We we yeah. kind of figured that out. But the most important thing, the most important thing is they said we will train you. So you come to Germany. Yeah. It's a Japanese machine. It will supply from Germany. You come to our factory. We will train you. So we. And that was a priceless. This was absolutely priceless. That's right. We left in November September to go back home to Australia from the A&B fair. The machine purchasing was all kind of taking place during that time, the next two months. And they said, early February, come back to Germany. And in early February, you will be trained for one week in uh, Eschenlohe. No, sorry, in Munich? Uh, Esslingen. Ah, Esslingen. In yeah, Esslingen yeah. in Stuttgart to um, operate this machine. And bring some parts that you want to make it was a screw and a stem and they made i guess turnkey solutioned that machine for us and speaking of screws and stems alexander slavich says why screws and stems are those really the hard ones to get already made up to specs well i think it was a little it wasn't even to do with uh, like how difficult um it was to source to the components or to make them to learn but it was they were complex enough that would they would teach us the basic functions of the machine. So you had some, some threading, you had some turning, you had some grooving, and you had to mill some flats on the stem. So you had milling tools and turning tools and threading tools. Drilling, yes, we'll do so. yeah, drilling eventually, and um, and maybe possibly gear hobbing on the same machine. That that's was right. Kind of that was one of the ideas as well, which I guess we moved away from but that's another story yeah so it was, it was more based on the learning experience we could get from those components not necessarily the difficulty anyway so we come back early february to in fact i went to um, germany in early february to get trained and uh it's all a blur but i did my week of training and then i hopped on a train to go to switzerland to seek roy again yeah and I had no real reason reason to do so. It was a complete accident. I think. So, so, but before that, we made decisions. So we, we went on a fair, we saw the machines, we got the prices, and we realized that even at the best case, in the best case scenario, if we're buying maybe one brand new machine and maybe next three or four second hand, we can do one machine a year. One machine per year. That's one right. machine per year. We end up buying four machines in the first year. Correct. We went crazy. Yeah. We got addicted. We got really addicted, but that's fine. You know, I mean, you know, we risk it all, and yeah. you know, it was important for us as well to show the supporters. There was 113 people who like said yes on the first day, and the, by then maybe 500 plus people who bought, who bought watch. watches from us. It was very important for us to show them that we're actually serious yeah. about what we're doing. We're serious about. Like we're not just taking your money under the guise of oh we're, we're getting something. rich, yeah. we're getting rich. We invested every single cent from every yeah, single yeah, one of till sales. today, till, till today. Yeah, I say every time you buy something from us, you make us poor, not rich. That's right. We have to buy something. Well, because that money is already allocated for something else. And, but speed it up. So we end up. Okay. You end up with Groib again. You met Groib. I met Groib, and on in the, the, the phone and the first day, I toured around his um, factory and. Warehouse. Uh, warehouse, rather, and saw a bunch of machines, and I saw this. I, in fact, it was it was even more um, basic than that. I had a meeting with him, and he kind of asked me, so why are you here? You know, you travel. Well, he wanted to, you to buy something. That's really? right, yeah. he did. But he asked me, so what do you want to buy? Why are you here? You've traveled 20,000 kilometers and, and, a, and a whole day in a, in, a, in a plane to come here. And I said, I want a milling machine that will be able to mill watch parts. And he said, hmm, okay, I've got a couple of those, different brands and so on. And I said, yeah, maybe something like a Kern. We saw a Kern at, um, fair. at the fair. And he said, ah, oh, I've got a Kern. And I said, oh, okay, Kern Evo or something like that. And he said, no, 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 it's, uh, you might not have heard of it. It's a Kern Pyramid Nano. And I had heard of it because I kind of started my deep dive into research. research. The last like three months since the A&B fair, I, you know, every waking moment was spent looking at these machines. And he takes me down to his warehouse and he shows me this white and red cone pyramid nano. Mm. And I say, I didn't see this on your website. What's the deal? Like this is mm. like how many hours, hours and like what's the, is it how broken? Is it? is it old? Yeah. And he said, no, it just came in last week or two weeks ago. And I've nearly locked in a French buyer for this. 
And I said, ooh, French buyer, that's interesting. Probably not in the watchmaking industry, probably just something in precision in, in making. And I said, that's interesting. Let me make a phone call. How much? And I figured out the price with him and said, and he said, oh, it was about this much. And uh, I ring, but he also said he got it from. Oh, that's right. Most importantly, uh, we're looking around the machine and we go around the back of the machine and I see this little poster and it says something, something, something in French. French yeah. And down the very bottom of the poster, it says Rolex. It with the Rolex and I said, where did this machine come from, Max? And he said, oh, I just pulled it out from the Rolex factory last week or two weeks ago. And I said, that's bingo, that's the machine. Not only did I know that it was Kern making it, I knew that it was a very accurate machine. It was, I didn't even realize how accurate it truly was at that point, but I knew it was accurate. And so I, I say, Max, give me a moment, let me call Nick. And I call Nick and I say, um, I found this machine, I think it's gonna be good, we need to buy it. And he says, okay. No, and you said, <laughs> and you said, it came from Rolex. It came from Rolex. And I said, buy, buy. without even knowing how much it cost. Because at that point of time, it was, it was sort of, we were still on a high, I guess, from the I would, I would I would sell house to buy that machine. Yeah. Because it was, <laughs> it was such a power, like, you understand what it was. It was, never again, a Rolex yeah. can say, well, you're making the watch parts, but on some machine that is sub quality, right? You know, you want to be a Formula One driver, but you're driving Holden Arena, therefore it doesn't count, we're not the same league. But to buy their machine, that they kind of, it was, the reason why they sold the machine. Well, they sold it, from what I understand, they, they bought it in 2007, early 2007, and the people that were trained into how to use the machine in 2007 had either died, moved on to different departments, left the company, or were no longer interested in running that machine. So they ran out of operators, and it's, it's a very complex machine, a lot of systems. So that, that, was, that was probably why they sold the machine. But also, in Switzerland, you, you don't... There's, there's they still made a caveat on the sale, saying that... Yeah, the, the caveat for the sale. So they, they didn't sell the machine directly to an end, end user. They sold it to Max. With the caveat of this machine will, cannot be sold in Switzerland to the Swiss watchmaking industry. They didn't want their competition to buy the machine. That's right. They wanted that machine to go out of the watchmaking, outside of Switzerland, outside of the watchmaking industry. And for us, that was a perfect, perfect scenario because we suddenly became um, a really great buyer for Max. And he realized that. He realized that really quickly. Because uh, I, I don't think, even though he did say there was a French buy, I don't think he um, actually wow. was 100% on that. And more than that, um, th that reduced the price of the machine because that machine was very desirable in the watchmaking industry and not that desirable in other industries. I mean, obviously it was, but the real draw was all the surrounding watchmakers and they were excluded from, from the bidding. So we were very fortunate. It was timing. It was, it was perfect, perfect timing. Perfect timing. And a year later, about yeah. a year later, the machine, about nine, nine months. The machine time. finally arrived. Correct. And, and the same, in the same time, actually, you or you went to Switzerland once more in yeah. July. In July, you went to the EPHJ fair, yeah. and you toured around, and we bought the Affolter gear hopping machine from Max as well. Yeah. And both of those machines. We arrived. cannot tell where they come from. Really. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, the, the, the Affolter we cannot tell. No. But that um. Those two machines arrived uh, late 2017. Yeah. And so since late 2017, it's what? And then we bought Oh, Makino. that's right. And roughly around the same time, I think we put the purchase order in July for the Makino wire again. Because EPHJ is a Swiss, it's a tiny little fair. It's a small fair. It's just like one sort of- One whole. One whole fair, but it's watchmaking industry only. And I. If you're an independent watchmaker, if you're thinking about watchmaking, this is the fair to go. You don't go to Stuttgart A and B. You go to EPHJ That's in right. Geneva. And uh, what happened there? And yes, and and there you talk to watchmakers and machinists and sales people who deal it only with watchmaking industry. Mm. And and they know far more than your general sort of you know automotive uh, uh, machinists do. Uh, but there I realized that 
there are components which are highly prized even in Switzerland. Like you can make someone ask how long it takes to cut a, a, a stem screw. or screw. Yeah, how long? Uh, about forty seconds. Maybe so forty seconds one screw, right? So it's it's not a big deal. But there are components in Swiss industry that take one day to make one component. Mm. When and highly complex mm. geometry, yeah. like you know your rack for repeater, for example. You know, and, and some other components we, we, we can t that also require high finish. So you have a component made in the machine, and you still have to hand finish it. And that component will, could take a day to make. And these guys are using completely different machines than your standard milling and turning, you know, uh, run of mill machines. They're using something com completely different technology that is not even designed for for watch making to start with. And it was EDM wire cutting, wire erosion. And that's a new, new, new equipment piece of equipment, even for Swiss industry. It was probably at that point maybe a, a thirty or forty-year-old technology that had just entered just properly the Swiss watchmaking part industry. A lot of people used those types of machines to make uh, stamping presses and dies yeah. and the tooling required for the watchmaking industry, but very few people used it to make parts and that was kind of like a bingo for us as well so we can actually prototype quantity and that's what we were after we didn't want to make a, a thousand watches we wanted to make one that worked well this machine will help us do that yeah plus also it will help us make all the tools for other machines that correct and the tool holders and everything you know it, it really it's an engineering machine and and we had no choice we end up buying that machine brand new from akino japan direct we had training in singapore that's right Training and then in training in our yeah yeah over here in sydney over here in sydney so so that was kind of you know uh, at that point of time we we run out of everything we ran out of money we ran out of money <laughs> we ran out of space physical space, space yeah. because we end up you know buying a, a little factory unit yeah. uh, renovating it you know turning into a, a, a you know high precision sort of you know nice air clean space air conditioning but we run out of space we run out of air we couldn't cool the machines. Yeah, there was not enough cold air to sil circulate. We ran out of uh, power. Power. Yeah, yeah, we only had one hundred amps. At four hundred and fifteen volts. It wasn't. Yeah, wasn't three phase. Yeah. So we can only run really two machines at a time. Two machines at a time. Yeah. And we we're, st we're still to learn how to use those machines. That's right. And we had no idea. We had absolutely no idea. I mean, the other part of the the. the training was with Kern. Yeah. We did uh, a week, 10 days at Kern, or a bit less than 10 days at Kern. And they taught us how to run the machine, not how to make parts. So it was just like the maintenance, the um, the basic functions of programming on the machine, things like that. And uh, we got some training at Affoltaire on how to use the gear hobby machine. Mm -hmm. But that was a little bit too soon because we hadn't even made components on the milling machine which you kind of need to do before you step into gear hobbing but we still got that training and so we um yeah we really quickly progressed from a very rapid growth and buying stage investing in capital equipment and capability to uh to a focus on learning and and i remember nick dad said this year this next year, 2018, and 2018 and 19, all you're doing is learning. So just learn how to make these parts, learn how to fixture them, hold them, buy the cutters you need to buy, all this stuff. And I so went, yeah, tool yeah, up. And I went on a massive learning spree and made a lot of mistakes and made a lot, had a lot of successes as well. Let me just answer this question. Uh, it says, what is the uh, relationship between the German watchmakers with the Swiss, Swiss watchmakers alike? It, it's a two worlds. In Switzerland, you know, you think, oh, there is a Rolex factory, and that is true. Rolex is, is you know, and now you have Omega factory, and you know, uh, uh, in brand making making brand sort of factories, it's becoming trend. But this is very recent development. Historically, in Switzerland, Swiss watch industry at the peak of industry, you know, uh, and literally for the last hundred years, even longer than that, hundred twenty years, it was all about a vast number of small, highly specialized shops making one or two components. For example, I met in Switzerland a young man 
is a third generation, fourth generation um, uh, uh, um, uh, Turner and they have a fully automated line and they specialize in making watch stems only. And his output was 1.2 million stems a month. And I say, who buys those stems? 1.2 million stems. He said, we sell them all to Switzerland. He said, we even sell them to China. I said, how is it possible that you can sell a Swiss stem to Chinese customer? He said, Nick, I'm using material that my grandfather bought. You know? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and that becomes like, put those things in perspective. But because he's so highly specialized, he's running some machines that are already 30 and 40 and 50 years old. You know, he, he does not necessarily need to invest every you know, year into uh, you know, e e expanding uh, his factory. factory because he's making component that is 100 years old. Mm -hmm. you know, a stem, is, a stem in a Rolex today is no different than a stem that was in a Walton pocket watch, you know, just different size, or, or in, a, in Omega or in a Patek or uh, you know, 100 years ago. So, so we're dealing with, with you know, a screw is a screw, full stop. Mm -hmm. so, but then you have you have you have a you have a an operator or machinist or machine shop set up to make just a small cylindrical components uh, of let's say you know a certain diameter. Then you have your your your, your, your workshop that makes just uh, escapement components, and it can be even down to just one component in the escapement chain. Mm. Usually it's all three, but you know. Then you have I went to a small factory, twenty people, and all they do all they do they make a center wheel for the chronograph. But they make them for all brands, like no matter. So even, even the biggest brands, they are capable of making those components in house. They still go and deal with those small guys, specialists. And, and we went to, when we went to our forte, we're not going to mention names, but we watched the corporate video and they said, these are our customers. And you said, what, like, seriously? Why are we mentioning the names? Well, I don't know. Yeah, there's no reason. No reason not to mention. So it was like Patek was like 30%. Yeah. Among Rolex yeah. was like another 30%. Yeah, and then no. Rolex was like another 30%. We're not mentioning because we're not sure. I can't remember. Yeah, you know, I don't true, want to be true. quoted. You know. Yeah. But it was like, Affolte makes, Affolte makes parts for all Swiss brands you know, who are something in a business. Why? And I said, why do you make parts for them? They, they have all that equipment. I said, we're better because we've been making these, those parts for, before a brand was a brand. Yes. That's crazy. And the whole Swiss industry is very interconnected. And that's why it was possible to have so many different brands, which all look alike, because they all use, you know, Belgio 7750 movement, because that movement is made by, you know, you know, in a certain way. And then you have the dial maker and they, they put together watches. The whole thing. Where Germans, they kind of went out of business. They have to reinvent themselves. You know, starting with Lange and you had the Glasute and all these small brands and Nomos and they are actually doing what we're trying to do. You know, they're already doing what, you know, independent, truly independent, uh, self-sufficient, uh, not, rely, not relying, relying on the Swiss industry. So uh, even in Switzerland, there are companies like that, you yes. know, who, who, are, who are out of chain. But yeah, it's, so we're following, I think, German model rather than Swiss model. So anyway, this is way too long and way too yeah, 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 sorry about that. Uh, just wrap it up. Uh, the highlights so far. Yeah, Mary Ellen. <laughs> Hello, Mary Ellen. She asked, um, "What are you most What are you most proud of achieving over the last eight years, and what is the biggest lesson you've learned?" Yeah, well, I, I think that's the highlight sort of question for you. Uh, you you go first. Uh, for me, clearly, uh, you know, selling a, a Time Masters watch to Switzerland. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know, that, that was a big recognition. Uh, what's the lowest point? The lowest? Oh. Importing the Kern machine was a massive high, followed by massive low, because the machine sat there for about three months waiting for technician. the technician to arrive and uh, install and commission the machine. It was a 10 year old machine by then. And, um, we, yeah, we were under the assumption the machine was ready to be plugged in and ready to go mm. and make, we'll start learning, making all sorts of mistakes and parts and all the rest. But we quickly found out that um, there were a couple of things that were wrong with the machine. So not only that, everything was expensive. So the current technician 
who was there to install and commission the machine was being paid 1,500 euro per day and 100 euro per hour of traveling time to come here. 130. 130 euro per hour traveling time to come here. So he was on, you know, let's say it's like 50 hours there and back. So just calling him out was massive, cost. like 10,000 Australian dollars, if not more. But during the installation, so during the installation, he got about two thirds of the way through and we were really at the final stretch. We were kind of calibrating the machine and we, um, we realized that the X axis glass scale, uh, which is right in the heart of the machine, it's like you need to take everything off to get to it sort of thing, um, was, was broken, was, was defective. Playing up. It was playing up actually. It was working 80% of the time and not 20% of the time. And that wasn't actually good enough. We, we needed something that was stable. So we, we realized that, okay, we need, to, we need to get this thing here and um, the, part, the part gets sent over to Australia and it's the wrong part. So we get a, <laughs> we get a part that kind of is nearly the right part, but we have to then wait another week, week of paying him $1,500 a day to um, watch surface surface surfing. The yeah, beach. so he, he, I guess he took his holiday. It wasn't his fault, by it wasn't means. His fault. And we, we had a great relationship with. We can yeah, yeah, fantastic. It, but it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. It was well. It was I guess our first real defeat because there was nothing that I could do. There was nothing that Dad could do that would have fixed that. It was we were, we were purely at the mercy of someone else, and of, that's of DHL. Of DHL. It wasn't even Kern. It was DHL. How quickly they could ship it. And th that machine actually had a few more problems that w have since been sorted out and it's cost us a lot of money and that, that's been the heartbreaking moment behind everything. But it was a good relationship building relationship exercise yeah. and uh, you know, look from the positive side, we learned we're now able to do a fair bit of maintenance ourselves. Correct, yeah. I, could, I can take apart that skill myself and clean it if I really wanted to. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, that was, it, we realized that, how, that you know, when they laughed at us, oh, we're from Australia, they, they, they laughed for a reason because yeah. we are so far away from, like, that problem could not be, a, it would not be a problem in Germany. No. Yeah? In Germany, it would be $100 to drive the, the, yeah. the technician out, out of Munich, let's say like $200, and the cost of the spare part, and like, like the two or three hours that he's, he's there, you know, working for. But it's, we're so far away. That's, yeah. I guess, the takeaway. So this is where we are right now. I said I will, I will provide some tips, but I'm not going to do that. I think it's too long. Too long. <laughs> I say, I, I just basically, basically, I think the most important thing for us was the moment when we realized that we have to go out of Sydney, of Australia, and start visiting trade fairs, Excellent. machining fairs, uh, manufacturers, second-hand dealers, and I, I say, I mean, this is my, my tip for you. If you're sitting, no matter what you do, right? If you're sitting, if you're watchmaker and you're spending all your time behind the bench, you're an idiot. You know, you're not going to anywhere. I'm sorry, you know, I, I'm, I was an idiot for that. But, you know, and I learned this from a dentist who said he started making money first time. He's an American dentist. He said, first time I went to international Hong Kong fair uh, in relation to dentistry, he said, all of a sudden, I realized there's so many opportunities, so many ways to improve what I do, so many, you know, open the whole world for him. And he was a mature person, you know. So it happens to people that also, you know, it's good to happen to Josh when he was 16, 17, 18. I was 50, you know. If you're 55 or 60, whatever, it's still not too late. Start visiting your trade fairs. Even if you go there and you buy a $5 screwdriver, it will make a difference. You don't have to go there and spend, you know, it's the knowledge. It's the it's the perspective. It's just being part of that. Mm. You know, so that that's my tip number one. Tip number two: long hours. So how many hours do we put in this? Because there has to be some, you know. You want to learn how many hours? You, I mean, no hours. That, is is that the case? Like we were, whenever, you know. Yeah. I mean, weekend. I remember the first year. I was probably on sixty hours a week, every single week. I think Elon Musk talks a lot about that. He says that if you want to, if you want to fit two years worth of work in a year, you just have to work two years worth of work in a year. <laughs> you know, you have to put in the hours and, and and really focus. I guess just to wrap it up, where are we now and where are we going? Um, I, I think we might leave this for next time. 
Okay. We'll right. another Maybe another one, another one, one day. Um, if there is interest, if you like what we do, you know, and, and if you like to, f you know, stay in touch, send us an email. Mail at clockmaker.com.au. You can subscribe to our newsletter. We have over 11,000 subscribers who follow us for years. We've been doing newsletter, daily newsletter for over 20 years now. We uh, also have an Instagram page, yeah. Nicholas Sacco Watch. There, there's one thing I want to share with you, but it's so massive. It's a very short, I'm not going to do it today. It, it, it is, you know, it's my, about my idol. Who, uh. You know, if I, if I can be born again, I would be him, right? Is the most humble, most genuine, most intelligent person I ever met. It's okay. You don't have to talk about like uh, that about like, <laughs> me like that. <laughs> it's not you. <laughs> it is is a is. It, I can tell you, it was a it was a thirty first of December last year at nine o'clock when I met him, and I can't stop thinking about him. So, if you like, I can tell you that story maybe in five minutes, maybe ten minutes next time, but. You know, we'll do this again. We'll do it again. All right, guys. Well, happy Rebel the Day. Oh, we didn't even talk about the right to machine and right to uh, right to make and right to repair. Right to repair. Next time. Next time. Thank you very much for tuning in. I hope this was not a waste of time for you. We certainly enjoyed. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for commenting and tuning in. We'll see you next time. Bye.